specialization include uh, 20th and 21st century American literature, 19th century American literature, postmodernism, transatlantic modernism, history of literary criticism and theory, and film studies. And as a graduate fellow with the Institute for the Humanities this year, Ryan is completing his dissertation titled Feel Your Pain. Um, isn't that a quote from Bill Clinton? Yes. <laughs> um, neoliberalism and social form in contemporary American fiction. Although Ryan's dissertation is far too conceptually sophisticated um, to be summed up in one or even two sentences, I'm going to go ahead and do so anyway. Um, so Feel Your Pain identifies the broad repertoire of formal strategies through which the American novel since the 1980s mediates the political logic of neoliberalism, and it traces the ways in which these strategies generally, though not necessarily, work to contain the political horizon of contemporary American literature, I mean fiction, more specifically. So the excellence of Ryan's work is already being recognized um, beyond UIC through um, awards and publication <coughs> of work that's drawn from the dissertation, so uh, one of his essays, Clean Hands, Post-Political Form in Richard Power's Gain, is forthcoming in uh, the peer-reviewed journal 20th Century Literature. And for this uh, same essay, Ryan was awarded the, the Michael Sprinker um, Prize for Best Graduate Student Essay 
by the uh, Marxist literary group in 2011. Another essay, The Family Gone Wrong, Post Postmodernism and the Neoliberal Turn, has been accepted for publication in um, a critical volume, Postmodern, Postwar, and After. And this is going to be published later this year by the University of Iowa Press. And in addition, Ryan has published um, an essay that's entirely unrelated to his dissertation. Um, it's called The Narrative Production of Real Police. And this is in a collection of essays titled The Wire, the TV show, Urban Decay and American Television. This was published in 2009, and Ryan <coughs> received the department's, the English department's um, Selby Award for Outstanding Critical Essay for this essay in 2008. So his lecture today is based on, I think, on the final chapter of his dissertation, and it's titled Super NAFTA versus El Gran Mojado, Alternative Fictional Realities and the Fight for Free Trade. So please welcome Ryan. Um, thanks to Madhu for the introduction. Um, thank you to Sue and Linda and everyone here at the Institute. Um, it's been a really fantastic experience. Um, things have really heated up, especially this semester. Um, so thank you for giving me this opportunity. Um, <clears throat> again, my paper is entitled uh, Super NAFTA versus El Gran Mahato, Alternative Fictional Realities and the Fight for Free Trade. When Bill Clinton described the political battle over the North American Free Trade Agreement, as a, quote, symbolic struggle for the spirit of our country, it's safe to say he wasn't envisioning the kind of symbolic str struggle that ends Karen Te Yamashita's 1997 novel, Tropic of Orange, a fantastic, larger-than-life professional wrestling match. Staged in front of a huge multinational crowd at the fictional Pacific Rim Auditorium in Los Angeles, the fight features, in one corner, a wrestler named Super Nafta who enters the ring with a high-tech digital fanfare worthy of a Hollywood art director, who wears a titanium suit with a head of raging fire, and whose secret weapon is um, a missile launcher that shoots tiny Patriot missiles out of his finger. <coughs> in the other corner, we have El Gran Mahato, that is, the giant wetback, who appears in the ring by magic, whose costume includes a blue cape with the magic image of Guadalupe and an aura of gold feathers and blood roses, and whose secret weapon is a giant pair of angel's wings. In speeches to the crowd before the fight, the two wrestlers do seem to debate free trade. Super NAFTA promises his audience they will receive, quote, a piece of the action if they're willing to free the technology and the commerce that makes the money go round. While Mahato, whose alter ego is an itinerant street performer who is crossed into the U.S. from Mexico, responds that for poor people, quote, getting a piece of the action means dividing into tiny pieces what is always less and less. As the two wrestlers' props suggest, however, Yamashita characterizes the fight over NAFTA as not simply a political disagreement or a struggle over the distribution of wealth, but as a clash of what we might call epistemes. Super NAFTA represents, quote, the rational forces of the North, which Yamashita links with progress, technology, loans, and loaded guns while Mahato represents, quote, the magical world of the South, marked in the text by the blurring of the boundaries between past and present, folklore and history, and reality and performance. This magical world is the world of Latin American <coughs> magic realism, a link made explicit earlier in the novel, in a scene that implies that Mahato's alter, alter ego, Archangel, has stepped out of the pages of uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez's most famous short story, the very old man with enormous wings. Of course, this flamboyant intertextuality also pushes us to reflect on the very deployment of these magic realist elements, as if their real importance lies not in what they say about Latin America, but in the fact that they are being used by Yamashita, a Japanese-American novelist, in the first place. As Caroline Rohde argues, the novel's depiction of the chaotic arrival of, quote, the magic realism of the South in realist L.A., 
could be intended to serve as an allegory of the transnationalization of the U.S. novel. In this sense, the magical South embodies the blurring not just the conceptual boundaries, but of political borders, suggesting that the wrestling match between North and South is better understood as the struggle between the national and the transnational. Indeed, SuperNAFTA, the walking embodiment of an international trade agreement, is pointedly labeled, quote, a national hero, while Mahato is labeled an international hero, <coughs> as if Yamashita's project in this novel is precisely to rescue the radical potential of, as Rodi puts it, quote, boundary crossing, migration, the unstoppable flow of people and the literary imagination across the borders of, na of nations. Atomic Aztecs, a 2005 <coughs> novel by Seshu Foster, a Japanese-American novelist often compared to Yamashita, seems to offer a similar vision. Like Tropic of Orange, Foster's book responds to the contemporary plight of the Mojado by imagining a world governed by radically different, distinctly non-North American <coughs> epistemic values. This vision takes the form of an alternative history in which the pre-colonial Aztecs defeated the Spanish conquistadors and built a global civilization ruled not by European techno-rationality, but by, quote, Aztec techno-spirituality. Um, and I, I should say here that in this Aztec world, uh, most of the hard C's are spelled with a K, so it's Aztec with a K at the end. Um, techno-spirituality with a K where the C in techno should be. Um, in this world, the main character is in Zantli, a member of the indigenous Nahua tribe that founded the Aztec Empire, is keeper of the House of Darkness and the Aztec capital of Tecnatlitlan, <laughs> um, a celebrated, <coughs> and it's spelled weird too, that's why I mispronounced it, um, a celebrated warrior of caste in the leadership cadre of the elite jaguar. <coughs> in our world, which we see in narrative passages described initially as hallucinatory visions, the same character, however, is an impoverished illegal, toiling away under grim conditions on the kill floor of an East Los Angeles meatpacking plant. This shift in status suggests that Zanzali is disenfranchised and exploited in our timeline, that is, in real history, precisely because of the historical triumph of the European version of reality, as if, as if Foster believes, like Yamashita, that the way to resist the mistreatment of illegals is to imagine alternatives to, quote, the rational forces of the North. But Foster ultimately rejects this way of framing the political struggles of undocumented workers, I will argue, and he does so precisely by suggesting that even a world governed by different cultural or epistemic values would still be marked by the same structural imbalances that shape Zinzantli's life. In this, in, in this alternative reality, economic production is driven not by the exploitation of Mexican illegals, but by the human sacrifice of Spanish slaves and others, including, by the end of the Aztec portion of the narrative, Zinzantli himself. At the same time that the novel dispels the utopian potential of this Aztec world, however, it also creates a different type of alternative timeline a disruption of the linear narrative that seems to open up precisely because Zinzantli rejects his vision of an alternative history and decides, to et, decides instead to organize resistance at the meatpacking plant. I argue that these temporal twists and turns are designed to suggest that workers like those in this novel can create the possibility of an alternative future, as it might be called, only by embracing a vision of the world defined by the structural antagonism between labor and capital not by the conflict between nationalism and transnationalism or any other epistemic conflict. From the perspective articulated by Foster's novel, then, Yamashita's speculative attempt to, uh, as Sharon Vent, critic Sharon Vent puts it, to imagine the world otherwise seems less radical, less otherwise. Indeed, I will argue that reading these two novels together help, helps us see that despite Yamashita's opposition to NAFTA, her novel and liberal pro-NAFTA discourse characterize contemporary social relationships in a strikingly similar way. Making this connection is useful because, as critics like Rachel Adams have suggested, 
This social vision reflects a new development within, an Ameri within American fiction. Comparing Thomas Pynchon's 1966 novel, The Crying of Lot 49, The Tropic of Orange, Adam, Adams argues that whereas postmodern novels tend to represent the transnational connections created by globalization as occasions for or manifestations of paranoia and political paralysis, post-Cold War novels like Tropic of Orange tend to represent these same connections as, quote, a shared perception of community and thus the opportunity for, quote, innovative forms of mobilization, new political networks that bypass traditional coalitional categories. While I think Adams overstates the political quietism of the postmodern novel, the effective difference she identifies does point to what I see as a deeper difference. <coughs> Whereas postmodern novels tend to be interested in impersonal and antagonistic social systems, and concentrated asymmetries of power, if not necessarily class antagonism, contemporary novels tend to be interested in social relations based not on structural position, but on individual values and abilities. From the emotional and ethical bonds of family to those transnational communities of shared perception identified by Adams. We can draw discursive connections between these literary developments of the 1990s and the political de developments of the same decade, including, as I'll show here, Bill Clinton's support for free trade. Suggesting that these developments can be understood as a reflection of the same broader cultural shift, the shift that has come to be known as the neoliberal turn. <clears throat> the symbolic struggles for, I'm sorry, the symbolic struggles over NAFTA are a particularly good site for thinking about these developments because they crystallized the moment when the nation's most successful Democrat embraced what had been, at least in the previous decade, a Republican position. The attitude that promoting free trade is more important than protecting existing jobs from low-wage competition outside the U.S. Running on a pro-NAFTA platform in 1992 and pushing for the treaty's legislative approval in 1993, Clinton put himself at odds with the old Democrats in Congress, his main adversaries in these symbolic struggles, but firmly in step with the national political electorate, who supported both his candidacy and, according to the number of phone calls pouring into the White House on the eve of the congressional vote, NAFTA itself. As many have argued, Clinton's victories thus seem to confirm the shift suggested by the election of Ronald Reagan in 1980. Namely, that the right-wing enthusiasm for liberalized markets had moved to the center of American political discourse. Of course, during and after the 1992 presidential election, Clinton also strove to distinguish himself from his Republican predecessor and opponent, George H.W. Bush, the original American, American sponsor of the agreement. Like Bush, Clinton argued that easing restrictions on trade with Mexico and Canada would create new manufacturing jobs in the U.S. through the creation of new markets for American goods. But unlike Bush, he insisted that the agreement had to be accompanied by side treaties protecting labor and environmental standards, and more controversially, federal investment in education and retraining if capital flight or cheap imports cost American workers their jobs. This dual commitment to trade liberalization and investment in education and retraining was reportedly inspired in part by Clinton's Secretary of Labor, Robert Reich, whose 1990 book, The Work of Nations, provides a more fleshed out version of the worldview implicit in Clinton's speeches on NAFTA. Reich argues that the global economy is no longer comprised of discrete national economies dom dominated by large national corporations, but, quote, regions of a global economy increasingly dominated by transnational enterprise webs. Within this new economy, Reich suggests, the most valuable type of labor is not, not the manufacturing work necessary for the high volume standardized production of large national corporations, but the, what he calls the symbolic analytic work necessary for the high value specialized production of these new global webs. To help American workers then, U.S. economic policy should focus not on preserving the types of manufacturing jobs 
that will be lost due to trade liberalization, but on providing workers with the symbolic analytic skills necessary to participate in these new enterprise webs. Indeed, Reich argues that trade itself tends to inculcate the development of what he calls human capital, and thus the U.S. should reject what he calls zero-sum nationalism and, quote, eschew trade barriers against the products of any workforce, as well as obstacles to the movement of money and ideas across borders. <coughs> As Alex Wadden notes, as political scientist Alex Wadden notes, the call, this call for investment in hum, human capital was, quote, a more liberal call to arms than those which focus solely on freeing up economic borders or on slashing the size of government. Nevertheless, as Wadden also notes, quote, it did still, however, reflect a limited policy framework inasmuch as the human capital approach was a supply-side model which would provide workers with skills, but not actual jobs." End quote. Uh, in other words, this approach still evinces a faith in the power of the market itself to provide jobs for all those who have sufficient human capital. As this implication makes clear, the concept of human capital functions in various ways within Reich and Clinton's texts. The same multifunctionality that prompted Michel Foucault to put this concept at the heart of his prescient 1978 account of American neoliberalism. It signifies not just the economic value of an individual's set of skills and abilities, but also the source of individual and national wealth in an economy driven by innovation, as well as, more broadly still, a distinct vision of the dynamics of the market itself. We can, we can contrast this vision of the market, implicit in Clinton's rhetoric on NAFTA, with that of the old Democrats. And I should say, you know, Clinton's coalition was called the New, De New Democrats. Um, we can c contrast his vision with that of the old Democrats. Instead of inevitable tension between the internationalizing drive of capital and the needs of workers, the New Democrats see potential harmony between the interna internationalizing drive of capital and the needs of workers. This difference seems to translate, in turn, into a different vision of the role of the Democratic Party itself, a vision in which the New Democrats reproduce their disavowal of economic class conflict on the level of governmental politics. Instead of protecting workers from the internationalizing drive of capital, the New, the new Democrats will <coughs> harmonize these interests so that everyone, including both capital and labor, benefit from this drive. In this context, according to Reich, this means not just liberalizing trade and investing in human capital, but convincing the current class of symbolic analysts who, quote, constitute the greatest part of the most fortunate fifth of the population to embrace these strategies, thereby helping the bottom four fifths um, thereby helping the bottom four-fifths. This rhetoric implies that the way to aid the bottom four-fifths is not to do political battle with the fortunate fifth, perhaps by using regulation and redistribution to limit their ability to exploit the bottom four-fifths, but to find ways to motivate this fortunate class, as Reich puts it, um, in part by suggesting, as this book strives to do, that the dual commitment to free trade and human capital will make possible an ever-proliferating network of enterprise webs, enriching all nations in the process. Quote, we meet on an infinitely expanding terrain of human skills and knowledge, Reich insists. Quote, human capital, unlike physical or financial capital, has no inherent bounds. In Yamashita's Tropic of Orange, as I've already noted, free trade re results not in such boundless, self-generating wealth for all, but a situation in which, as El Gran <coughs> Mahato puts it, the 95% are forced to divide into tiny pieces what is always less and less. And yet, um, Yamashita ultimately depicts this struggle in a way that suggests the real problem with NAFTA is not that it deepens economic inequality, however, but that it embodies the rational forces of the North, which in this text means being committed to conceptual boundaries that obscure the economic, 
ecological and cultural complexity of globalization. Thus, while Yamashita and the New Democrats disagree about whether NAFTA is, in effect, a heel or a hero of the people, like Algran Mahato, they do agree about what it means to be a hero of the people at this moment in history. It means being an international hero, waging an epistemic battle against the forces of zero-sum nationalism. All those who, who refuse to recognize that we live in a transnational world and who want to, as Clinton puts it, turn inward, building walls of protectionism around our nation. Fittingly, each of the novel's formal elements, from multinational characters like Mojado to the network stru structure with which it interrelates these characters, are designed to articulate this new social inter interdependence. Its chief magic realist gesture, for example, is to literalize the cliche that under globalization, the far away has become close by. Yearly immigration from Mexico to the US more than doubled between 1993 and 2000. And the novel imagines that as this wave of migrants begins to flow north, the entire southern landscape, starting with the area around the Tropic of Cancer, flows north with them, transforming <laughs> geography and pushing vast crowds of people into downtown Los Angeles. Standing on an overpass in downtown LA, a character named Manzanar Murakami observes that the migrating south will, quote, soon crush itself into every pocket and crevice, filling a northern vacuum with its cultural conflicts, political disruption, romantic language, with its 100 years of solitude and its tropical sadness. As this phrasing and the reference to Gabriel Garcia Marquez, 100 Years of Solitude, and Claude Levi-Strauss' Tropical Sadness suggest, it is not just the southern geography and population flowing north, but southern history and culture as well. This storyline is a good example, then, of how in Tropic of Orange, the breakdown of national borders is, is always at once the breakdown of rational borders. Here the breakdown of the boundaries between past and present, representation and reality, and more generally, the boundaries separating order from disorder. That is, the novel explicitly links this chaotic northern migration to the Mexican government's efforts to make their nation more attractive to foreign investment and trade, including the financial manipulations that led to the collapse of the peso in 1995, and of course, NAFTA itself. Thus, while the liberalization of trade is often touted as a way to make the economic relationships between nations more efficient as each nation embraces their comparative advantage, and while NAFTA was justified in part as a way to decrease illegal immigration, this, this book suggests that freer trade has produced not economic specialization and social order, but disruption, instability, and chaos. And as the movement of the land itself suggests, this disruption is also an ecological disruption, meaning, as various critics have noted, the dialectic of order and disorder can be read in environmental terms as well, as if nature is enacting its revenge on those forces which try to control and exploit it. <clears throat> These linkages are why NAFTA is characterized as a rational force and why the rational is characterized as the enemy of the transnational. Such transnationalism undoes the very premises of the rational from the inside, and thus must be suppressed. Of course, while Yamashita dramatizes how these transnational flows can lead to cultural conflicts and political disruption, <coughs> she also suggests that they can help bring about positive social change an attitude that separates her from one of the most famous critics of NAFTA, Republican commentator Patrick Buchanan, who agrees, like, like Clinton and Yamashita, that this is a symbolic struggle between the national and the international, but who is squarely on the side of the national. Uh, while, by, while Buchanan argues that free trade threatens American sovereignty, and that as the subtitles as, one of the, as the subtitle of one of his book warns, quote, immigrant invasions imperil our country and civilization. Yamashita imagines that this same invasion 
and more centrally, the transnational, transrational sensitivity that they seem to carry with them can be the foundation for new, more progressive social networks. These new epistemic communities proliferate in the novel, from the squatters who respond to a tainted orange crisis caused by a convoluted global supply chain by embracing economic, quote, self-sufficiency, complete with a, an urban guarded planted under the hood of a broken down automobile, to the new community embodied by Yamashita herself. That is, the U.S. novelists who incorporate magic realist elements in their new transnational fictions. <coughs> the, pur the purest distillation of, of this utopian imagery, however, <coughs> centers around Manzanar, the homeless former surgeon who, from his vantage point above the freeways, is the first to recognize the spread of the magical south into, the Los, An into Los Angeles as well as other, quote, complexity of layers that ordinary persons never bother to notice. The, the complex grid of pattern, spatial discernment, body politic, that encompasses everything from obscure traffic patterns to the very geology of the land. He expresses this sensitivity by pretending, or by imagining, that he is conducting the Los Angeles traffic like the conductor of a symphony. By the end of the novel, this fantasy seems to have caught on. Quote, little by little, Manzanar began to sense a new kind of grid. This one defined not by inanimate structures or other living things, but by himself and others like him. He found himself at the heart of an expanding symphony of which he was not the only conductor. On a distant overpass, he could make out the odd mirror of his figure, waving a baton. And beyond that, another, another homeless person had also taken up the baton. And across the city, on overpasses and street corners, from balconies and park benches, people held bran branches and pencils, toothbrushes and carrot sticks, and conducted." End quote. This image of a new kind of grid Seems to, seems to depict the emergence of a new, more egalitarian social order, grounded in a new set of epistemic commitments, those held by Anz Manzanar and others like him, namely a sensitivity to the complexity of layers that in our world, ordinary persons never bother to notice. What's striking about this utopia, however, is how closely it resembles the vision in neoliberal political texts. Just as Reich imagines a world comprised solely of human capital, rather than a world defined by the structural distinction between labor and capital, Yamashita imagines an expanding symphony comprised solely of conductors, rather than a symphony defined by the structural distinction between performers and conductors. In Reich's text, moreover, what follows from this disavowal of structural antagonism is a vision in which social transformation happens not through political force, in which one group uses collective action and in state institutions to impose their will on another group, but through a change in perception, in which those in power are convinced to act in the benefit of those who are not. In Yamashita's novel, similar, similarly, what follows from the disavowal of structural antagonism is a vision in which social transformation happens not because a metaphoric conductor imposes his will on others, but because those other figures are moved to embrace his vision, as if this new order emerges from within rather than being imposed from without. Of course, it is only by virtue of these disavowals that this new kind of grid can count as a brighter future for the homeless people in Yamashita's novel, or the displaced workers in Reich's book. From a perspective that insists on such antagonism, <clears throat> human capital absolutely does have an inherent bound, namely the limit internal to all forms of capital, according to which capital only has value if not everyone has it, or what amounts to the same thing, the internal limit which prompts, which prompts those with capital to resist its redistribution to those who don't. From this perspective, then, it doesn't matter how many people are moved to recognize the complexity of the new transnationalism. No matter how far this expanding symphony expands, 
only some of these people will ever have the human capital necessary to actually participate in the new enterprise webs. This conflict reemerges in political history. Clinton was successful in his symbolic struggle to pass NAFTA, but he was mostly unsuccessful in convincing the fortunate fifth to support job training. But this conflict is mainly absent from these texts. Indeed, in Yamashita's novel, such antagonism er emerges only as a problem, a theoretical error to be resolved, not the prerequisite for political resistance to the capital. This is the, impl impl the implication of a parallel analyzed by critic Sharon Vince in a 2012 article that the book establishes between the plight of the Mahato on one hand and a subplot re regarding the sale of transplant organs on the other. The imagery of this border, border of these border crossing scenes, of the border crossing scenes, suggests that free trade prompts quote Mexican labor to cross into the U.S. without allowing Mexicans as embodied living beings to do likewise, as Vent puts it. And the parallel with the organ transplant market is that quote just as the human body is physically destroyed when cut up to become organs as commodities so too is the full human subject destroyed when reduced to the commodity of labor power. That's Vince's quote. Um, on one level, this reading suggests that displaced Mexican nationals are not victims of exploitation, impoverished to make other people rich, but victims of reduction. They are treated like labor power, but not citizens, and thus the full complexity of their lived experience is not acknowledged. This framing implies that the solution to the injustices of trade liberalization is to treat in undocumented workers as citizens, not just as labor power. A solution that might seem insufficient to the displaced Mexican farmers working in Mexican maquiladora factories or the displaced American factory workers working in low paying jobs in the US service industry. On a, deep, on a deeper level, moreover, the novel suggests <coughs> that even thinking of undocumented workers as labor is a way of doing violence to their status as embodied living beings. Another instance, like NAFTA itself, of the binar binaries, rationalisms, and reductive materialism of Western modernity, as Caroline Rohde puts it. Therefore, this way of thinking must be transcended in order for the transnational utopias envisioned by the no novel to become a reality. As I started to suggest above, Seshu Foster's Atomic Aztecs seems to be structured by a similar analogy. In our world, Zizantli is cheap, undocumented labor, reduced to the commodity of labor power, and he has been physically destroyed as a result. Years of working the line at the Farmer John Slaughterhouse have left them with a missing fingertip, a damaged knee, a permanent knife, night cough from the chlorine used to clean the plant, and a permanent, quote, coating of, quote, shit stink, the stench of work, my job. In the Aztec world, Zenzantli has been made whole, elevated from the bloody kill floor to the status of respected warrior of caste, the Aztec's keeper of the House of Darkness. As I also started to suggest, however, in Foster's novel, the triumph of the Aztecs pointedly does not end the violence of oppression in the New World. Though their civilization is built on values antithetical to those of, quote, the stupider realities in which the Aztec civilization was destroyed, just plain ugly realities which in no way fit our aesthetic conception of how the universe is supposed to run, end quote, this smarter, more beautiful reality will turn out to be just as asymmetrical as our own. Not only is Aztec civilization powered by the mass human sacrifice of Spanish slaves, but the governing Aztec Socialist Party even has its own clique of neoliberal economists. <laughs> Click with a K. <laughs> economists with a K. Um, run by a former slave trader and the current Minister of Labor, whose market reforms put this clique in conflict, like Clinton and his Secretary of Labor, with the party's, quote, trade union positions. These elements seem designed to make it impossible for those who care about Zinzantli's plight in our history to embrace this alternate history either. As if Foster wants to suggest that the aesthetic superiority of the Aztec vision of reality, 
which Zanzali insists on throughout the novel, is precisely that, a purely aesthetic superiority, a matter of mere appearance. Like the difference between words spelled with a C and words spelled with a K, the two realities look different but end up meaning the same thing. Eventually the decision is made, seemingly because of these inter-party squabbles and various political machinations, that Zanzantli himself must be sacrificed. And yet the chapter in which Zanzali is finally disemboweled on top of the Great Pyramid ends on an impossibly defiant note. Quote, except that never happened. Let me make that clear. I would never let that happen. It might have happened on some alternate reality when I wasn't looking, some fucking other world when they didn't let me get my two cents in. But it didn't happen this time, because I didn't let it happen. I had to make my move sooner, at some previous point in history, so that could never occur." End quote. The next chapter is a flashback to an earlier point in the Aztec timeline, a sequence in which Zanzani himself escapes from slavery and learns how, quote, being free felt. But there is nothing in that chapter or the rest of the novel to suggest that his life in the Aztec world will turn out any differently. Um, indeed, or instead, the book ends with three consecutive chapters focusing on his life at the meat packing plant, the longest stretch of the novel to do so. As if to make, make clear that this time, becoming free will require him to make his move in our reality, not in that fucking other world. His move will turn out to be leading a union ratification drive at the plant, successfully gathering and delivering ratification petitions bloody from the slaughterhouse floor to his CIO rep, despite being under constant surveillance by a management spy. And sure enough, this move will happen at, quote, some previous point in history. That is, the novel imagines that Zinzali will be able to literally change history, not the history of the post-colonial Americas, but its own personal history, precisely by unionizing, an act that will require him to acknowledge, not deny, his status as labor. This historical disruption is made possible, in a formal sense, by a narrative which, while never entirely clear or stable, seems to begin close to the present day when Zanzantli's children are full-grown adults, only to flash back closer to mid-century, when his children are still children or haven't been born yet in the midst of the CIO drive to unionize the plant. And it was still the CIO at that point. Uh, in the novel's final chapter, Zanzali succeeds in scheduling the union certification vote and is beaten but not broken by a pair of LA cops in search of the now, his now missing foreman, who has apparently robbed the company and skipped town, although there are also dark hints that uh, what really has happened is Zanzali has murdered him. Um, on the book's final page, trying to recover from his beating, Zinzali muses that, quote, I might even think this was the mechanism of my doom and permanent exile from Aslan, except that I've existed in this condition so long it has become second nature, end quote. I argue that this ending gestures toward the possibility that because of his political radicalization, or maybe just because of his beating, Zanzali may stop having hallucinations or fantasies about the Aztec socialist imperium, thus triggering his, quote, permanent exile from Aslan, the name of the mythical pre-Columbian homeland of the Aztecs. And while the second clause of this strange sentence seems to negate this possibility, quote, I've, I've existed in this condition so long it has become second nature, to call something second nature is, of course, to denaturalize it to suggest that it might be subject to historical change after all. If Zanzali really is exiled from Aslan, however, the consequences would indeed be radical, as it would mean that his life at the end of the novel, set close to mid-century, will not segue into his life at the beginning of the novel, set closer to our time, when he still believes he is an Aztec warrior despite being a broken down meat packer bullied by an abusive, conspicuously still present foreman. In other words, through these narrative manipulations, 
Foster gestures to the possibility that by embracing the antagonism between workers and management, Zanzani has created the option of an alternative future for himself. A future different from the one in which, in both realities, he, he winds up as a kind of human sacrifice. This vision is, in a sense, transnational, as Zanzani's fellow union members include everyone from, quote, Europeans, like his Anglo friend Ray, to, quote, a short, thick guy, Nakadal, a black Central American Taoist happy fat man. But in Yamashita's novel, this vision would count, of course, as a form of reductive materialism, as it transforms the complexity of layers into an irreducible binarism. To put this another way, whereas Tropic of Orange transforms L realist LA into the magical world of the South, Atomic Aztec rejects this magical world in favor of an LA which is not realist in the stylistic sense, but which nevertheless reflects realism's traditional function, representing the social dynamics and shit stink of modern urban life. We might therefore describe Foster's speculative vision as nostalgic, especially in light of the obvious fact that Zinzantli's future is already our not so recent past. The time before neoliberalism and the precipitous decline of the political power of American unions. Uh, NAFTA itself has just turned 20 years old, and in literary criticism, transnationalism has become a buzzword. By the same token, however, the very unthinkability of a powerful union movement at this moment in history can make it seem like a radical option after all. Especially, I think, to the group that this novel is about, on one hand, and the group that is most likely to read it, on the other. Uh, as Leon Fink notes, quoting Mike Davis, immigrant workers have made Los Angeles, quote, the major research and development <coughs> center for 21st century trade unionism. Uh, meanwhile, if 2013 was the year of the adjunct, as some have suggested, then those of us who are graduate students or recent PhDs in the humanities, the chief audience for experimental texts like these, are only, are only just now beginning to come around with a way of thinking in Foster's novel. That is, there seems to be a groundswell of young academics starting to embrace the fact that, while our destiny will probably not include missing fingertips, slashed knees, or permanent night coughs, nevertheless our destiny is as cheap, exploitable, highly precarious academic labor. But this is why it matters, I think, that Atomic Aztecs is not ultimately a pure example of the alternative history genre. In the end, it doesn't ask us to pretend that what happened didn't happen, like the standard counterfactual history, but to consider a means by which what happens after the last page of the book, that is, after the book is closed, might play out differently. Thank you. kind of questions that you for, forbidden me from asking. Yeah. Cool. Uh, I mean, yeah, if you want to ask, go for it. That's okay. I guess the connection there would be um, the idea that sort of embracing locality, um, embracing self, uh, self-reliance, self-subsistence, that would be a way of thinking more holistically, and that would be the sense in which, which although clearly, in one sense that is perfectly rational, but 
I guess you could, I, it, the logic of the text seems to, seems to suggest that would count as an alternative to the rational forces of the North because it involves sort of acknowledging the um, close relationship with humans in the natural world and the need to kind of constantly um, be conservative and self-sustaining in your relationship to um, the natural world. I, I think that's, if I had to sort of explain how that worked within the logic of the novel, maybe I would put it that way. Okay, so, so it's not, sorry, this is probably just some philosopher's obsession, so it's not really about rationality. Rational here is, is in some ways, it's sort of like a term of abuse for that unfortunate stuff that neoliberals worry about. Yeah, I mean, it's, um, I think, you know, ultimately, <clears throat> her end game is to sort of insist on the importance of the transnational. And one of the ways she does that is to use rational as a term of abuse, as you said, um, for everything that is anti-transnational. Um, um, you know, I mean, the, the logic of magic realism, um, in which you have magical things coexisting unproblematically with realist things, in of itself seems to sort of try to resist um, the clear, de clear delineations that she seems to uh, make equivalent to the rational, if that makes sense. I don't know. Um, Um, I was wondering, in the atomic Aztec, what you were thinking about as the function of this, what you ultimately say is a nostalgic vision, uh, because it seems like he engages in it for a while and then um, throws it aside to embrace um, an alternative future that involved unionism. So is there a kind of development in his character that pushes him first to one choice and then uh, realizes its um, ineffectuality? Um, yeah, and just to clarify, when I so when I refer to his nostalgic vision at the end, I'm actually I'm, I'm saying that you you know if I'm making the argument that this book sort of uh, advances this kind of pro-union vision, and a union that in a, in a vision that in a way stylistically is a kind of embrace of realism in a certain sense, that you could say that vision is nostalgic. Oh. Um, so then what is the function of the um, Aztec? Uh, it's almost like I, I read it as he's imagining um, one way, it's like the novel works through one way of thinking about how we should respond to the contemporary plight of the Mojado. Um, and it's like, it's almost like through the narrative logic of the text, it works through this one way of framing the situation, um, only to kind of reject it. Okay. Um, there is, I mean, I don't, I'm probably not really prepared to adequately talk about this, but, um, but I will say, so this idea of a, a fantasy of, um, you know, an Aztec world as a kind of more viable, you know, a, a, as a kind of possible solution to the, pri the plight of illegals, um, that does have some have a kind of real world purchase in the sense that, um, um, you know, in the Chicano movement of the 60s, 70s, this image of Aslan was kind of deployed as a way of trying to think about. Um, um, Chicano nationalism and as a way of thinking about things, making things better for. So it, it was a, a kind of indigenous um, uh, recuperation of, of a kind of more powerful identity. Exactly, um, and I one thing, and I didn't, I didn't, you know, I didn't necessarily have space to talk about this. So Seshu Foster, he's Japanese American who grew up in East LA in a largely Chicano neighborhood. And he's talked about how um, while the Aslan movement 
or as a concept, was a was a you know a viable way of thinking and had a lot of appeal and was politically useful at a certain point of history. He's also talked about how, because of his own kind of complex subject position, um, he also found it somewhat alienating. And you know he, he um, so you can I feel like you can kind of you could see that sort of resistance implicit in how he imagines that in this text, I think, too. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Brian, can I push you a little bit on your reading of Tropic of Orange? Okay. Like, it seems like, I think you're picking up on, I think there is some kind of critical difference between the way the two texts pose the relationships that you're talking about, but I feel like the casting of um, Tropic of Orange as utopic is kind of premature, right? Like I think even the utopic scenarios in the text are underscored as such and then get undermined pretty quickly. So that even the wrestling match, one, um, you know, the um, Archangel character loses that match and then there's an immediate discussion about receipts are counted and another champion is being groomed, and the entire thing is really seen as a kind of commercial spectacle, right? And that all of the workers in the auditorium are just going to go back to work and back to their regular lives. Um, you know, the homeless occupation of the freeway, right? When where there's all these you know smart DIY kind of alternative systems and ways of being and living. Um, you know, the characters say, you know, come on, how long do you think this is going to last before the LAPD and National Guard come in? And then everybody gets assassinated and shot, right, as the helicopters swoop in. And so it seems to me like the text is actually trying to leave it a kind of open question, right, historically in terms of what the possibilities are. Um, and then there is actual a link to labor where it, like, you're not talking about the character of Rafaela, whose advocacy for unionizing workers, right, is like the impetus for her leaving LA in the first place. And that also is an open question about what the destiny of what of what that possible movement is going to be. Okay. So. Yeah, I mean, the, this is, these are great points. Um, you could think, I think you could think of it as um, almost like there's three kind of u crucial utopian gestures in a way. There's the two major plot lines. There's the um, South coming north, which culminates in the wrestling match. And just as you say, so Archangel, he, he kind of seems to win the wrestling match, but then they say, like, no, Supernaft just shot a Patriot missile in his heart. Uh, and then things just seem to continue on. Another champion will be groomed. And then in the other major plot line, which is the, the orange, tainted orange crisis, which causes the <laughs> traffic accident on the highway, which then is taken over by the squatters, just as you said, that, um, that new community of squatters, that new communal self-sufficient um, people who've occupied the highway, um, the, the army comes in and everyone is... Um, Everything's suppressed and wiped out. So in a sense, you could say the two major subplots, the two major plot lines both end in the violent suppression <laughs> of these utopian possibilities through high-tech, you know, um, rational north um, <coughs> weaponry. However, I, a couple, so I would, but I, I would sort of say, I think the Manzanar thing, that, that never is really suppressed. I mean, that's kind of, that's like, I feel like that, that vision sort of is left to kind of persist and maintain its, its kind of utopian uh, sheen um, even by the end of the novel. Whereas those other two, they're violently suppressed. That one is sort of just left to kind of float around. And I think maybe even, you know, it might even be worth, maybe I need to think more about the specific relationship between those other two and, and, and that kind of more narrow moment. Um, because with Manzanar, it's just a bunch of homeless people standing on top of freeway overpasses, mm -hmm. waving their arms around, yeah. right? There's not a challenge to power, so it makes sense that there would be no yeah. violent state repression right. of those moments. Right. But I still think that, that we're supposed to sort of see something embryonic about 
the new kind of grid. I mean, I, that language to me is deeply utopian, even if it has no concrete purchase. Um, also, I mean, even the even the, the sort of the end of the wrestling match, if you think about it, it's so the wrestling match, one one person seems to win and then the other person wins, they both lose, the cycle continues. To me, the, the logic of that ending is it's almost this commitment to this, uh, you know, the, the irreducible play of something almost natural. Like it's a commitment to some sort of um, organic logic that's going to keep playing out, playing out, and it's almost like the system itself, or the irreducibility of complexity, at, even at that moment, is sort of reified in a certain way. Um, I, I don't know. So, which to me is a kind of, and it might be that that complexity is the same thing that Manzanar is identifying with. Um, I, I, I don't know. May, I, I guess to answer your question, I would maybe speak to the to the, um, the vision he has. In terms of Raffaella, um, I don't know, I feel like in some of the relationships in the book, the character relationships, um, like for instance, her husband, you know, he's work, 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 he's, a, he's an immigrant, he's all about, he has like three jobs, he's constantly working. Um, he thinks of himself in a way as labor, not in the unionized sense in which she does, but the, the book kind of makes it seem like he needs to like. He needs to basically um, like uh, loosen up. <laughs> He's thinking. He thinks of himself in terms of work, and the need to work. And the book, to me, and seems family. And family. Like he has to think outside of the unit of the family to have a larger collective vision. To to me, the book's criticism of him is not you need you need to be think more radically and collectively. It's you're too committed to this. You too, you're too committed to the value of money. Mm -hmm. So it's in a weird way an ant, kind of anti-left position, I think. I mean, that's my take on it. But yeah. Can I? Sure, sure. <laughs> so um, it's kind of uh, developing what Helen is saying um, into the question of genre. Mm -hmm. um, I know that you know uh, the magical realism in, in um, topic of orange is often like read in a celebratory way by critics, but isn't it also possible to read? that in the ways that Helen is suge was suggesting that it's, the novel is exploring that as one genre mode for, you know, which was powerful in a, like a, um, an early post-colonial moment. Um, and so the novel is testing that and showing that it, it goes this far and then it's kind of defeated so that in that sense, we can read the novel as a really self, as a pretty self-conscious comment on the insufficiency of that genre um, <coughs> to say anything, you know, utopian or interesting about the the, the about globalization or about you know global capital. Does that make any sense? That the novel is dramatizing in order to reveal the limits or the insufficiency of magical realism as a genre that can say anything revealing about mm -hmm. the present. Yeah, and I mean, I guess. I would need to think about this more, but I, I feel like my response would be yes, exactly, and that's why the point, the, the, what the novel ultimately is, is not simply a magic realist text, but it's a transnationalized American novel. That, mm -hmm. that, so what would be the difference between those two things? Well, I mean, like, so, I mean, I think it's exactly right to say that, I mean, the, there's, there's so many different there's so many different genres you could articulate or identify sort of floating through Tropic of Orange. I mean, there's, and, and Magic Realist, Magic Realism to me is maybe the most important one, but there's, I mean, there's all kinds of like sort of quotations and references to detective fiction and disaster fiction and, um, you know, I think it's a sort of, uh, it's a network novel in terms of the way the characters are related. Um, um, it's, uh, you know, ultimately about, so I, I mean, I don't know, I, I think um, maybe the, the term, I would, term I would use to contain all that is just the, <coughs> transnat the transnational novel, if that makes sense, but, yeah. yeah. So that's actually a kind of follow-up, I mean, I don't, 
I know very little about uh, magical realism, but I'm not quite sure I understood um, what you were saying, especially when you have to answer the question. So I, I'm thinking, say, of like Emilio Salvi's criticism of magical realism, which is really to argue that it is from the start what in your terms would be a kind of neoliberalizing genre. In other words, not that it, it had use at one point, but that it gets used up, but that it's very categories in which it imagines itself as a genre are already committed to certain models of the family, certain models of, of, of agency, et cetera, which be understood as, uh, which he would salary understands precisely as, as neoliberal. And it's sort of, so it's a little bit different. I mean, his reading, I'm not, I'm not sure where yours is, it's a little bit different from what from what Mad is suggesting. It would also sort of be structurally sort of different from what Heller was suggesting. But again, my question is where you stand in this, where the problem would be not that these visions are utopian and that they fail, um, that there's that they're in some sense not uh, realistic, but rather that the stru the the structure of their utopianism is problematic. In other words, it's not their utopian character, it's the it's the it's the thing they it's not that they can't get what they want, it's that on your, from your standpoint, they want the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. So I sort of thought that the point of the Reich, for example, was to say, well, in a certain sense, Reich's vision is just as utopian as, uh, as uh, Yamashita's. In other words, you're not going to get it, right? Uh, but that it's not, that from the standpoint that you want to adopt, its problem is not the degree to which you can and can't get it. Its problem is the very structure that, of its imaginary is already committed to um, a set of, uh, a, a way of understanding, let's say, uh, its own processes, which is right from the start identified with what for you in this, in this uh, talk is identified with human capital. So there, the point wouldn't be that it didn't work. The point would be that it wouldn't be any better if it didn't work. That either way, it's sort of completely... So that wasn't your response. I'm, what I'm asking, I guess what I'm asking is, where do, you, where do you identify your own argument in relation to these sort of two ways of thinking about um, what everybody seems to agree are these utopian moments in two texts which I should I mentioned at the start, not of which I've ever read? Um, I, I'm probably going to need to think more, but um, I guess my argument is that um, the logic of Tropic of Orange is to um, uh, to resist a kind of um, commitment to the irreducibility of certain antagonisms is to um, stage the breakdown of various uh, binaries, borders, um, including through its own act of using magic realism, magic realist still signifiers um, what you could think of as the boundary between an American novel and a Latin American. Um, I think by, by staging a logic in which um, structural boundaries are continually breaking down, in which um, the book doesn't, although it's often been claimed that this is the case, the book doesn't really attempt to map power in, in the 90s in, in Los Angeles. It sort of stages the proliferation of different ways of mapping. Um, you know, it says there are maps and maps and maps. Um, it doesn't attempt to articulate a map by which we can see where power is located and where non-power is located. In Tropic of Orange, I mean, what's striking about it, and those of you who read it will notice, I mean, there's no, it's often described as, as an attempt to map power, but there's no, pa there's no one powerful in the novel. I mean, there's no rich person. There's people who are middle class, but it's all just this sort of proliferation of marginalities, um, except for the abstract forces of the, of the rational. There's never like an agent of power, um, a character. Um, so, and I, I see connection between that resistance to structural antagonism and the neoliberal project. Um, that sort of, the histor act of historicizing, literary historicizing I'm trying to do is to articulate that connection. To suggest Tropic of Orange is a, is a part of the same moment <coughs> as the work of nations. Um, now, uh, 
you know, they're both, both books are utopian. I, I maybe this is what, both books are utopian. Um, however, I think, so maybe, yeah, the problem isn't it's utopian or not. The problem is her specific version of how um, conflict is articulated to me seems like um, not, not an alternative to neoliberalism, but just sort of basically performance of it. And thus, it's hard to see how that could even count as sort of a radical alternative. Um, can, I, can I say one quick follow-up thing, Anna? But I, I thought that what um, Helen and I were both trying to point out was that it's not actually all the things that you're referring to as utopian. Different characters perceive it as utopian, but the novel itself doesn't see as utopian at all. So it's not that in the novel, the novel wants certain things that it then shows to be defeated, but it, it undermines or deflates things that appear to be utopian or not. So I just wanted to clarify that. Yeah, and it, I, it seems my like response a deeply is, dystopian novel. Well, see, my response is to suggest no, it actually is committed to certain. Okay, so um, that's. You know, another one, let's see if I can talk this out. There's, I mean, there's another example of the, so there's the expanding symphony where there's only, there's only conductors, there's no performers. You know, sort of avoiding that conflict between conductor and performer. In the same way, at the very beginning of, this book, of the book, there's this alternate table of contents called something like the hypercontext. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's, the point of it seems to be to sort of give the reader the opportunity to chart out their own map or their own passage through the novel. Um, rather than being forced to observe, observe the narrative line carved out by the author. And to me, that's, 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 like, that's like a facing the difference between conductor and performer. That's a facing the difference between author and reader. And it's this attempt to kind of um, turn the novel into this utopian space where there is no difference between author and reader and where readers are just as free to chart out their own narrative as author. Um, which to me is also yet another iteration of the logic of human capital. Um, so, so things like that make me see, I, I, I think the novel is committed to um, certain things rather than simply trying to problematize them or show their own things. Um, yeah, sorry. Um, you kind of mentioned an environmental dialectic between order and disorder as a result of NAFTA. I just wanted to hear you elaborate on that. Um, well, I think, um, so it, I guess it's, it seems to be, well, here's another example of it in the book. Um, another subplot involves uh, this tainted orange scare. Um, it's a foodborne crisis. And the book suggests, and, and this tainted orange like causes a huge accident on the highway, and it has all these like proliferating catastrophic effects. And the book suggests, well, the reason why there's this tainted orange crisis is because um, different national governments attempted to establish quotas for um, like. You know, you can import this amount of oranges from Mexico at this time of year. Um, what happens is people, people see this attempt to impose order, in a sense, on um, global agricultural trade, and then they subvert it. They, they start, so they'll, they'll get oranges from one country, and then they'll import it into Mexico, and then they'll import it into the United States. Or, um, um, or even, you know, or even add a country to that. So, and what happens is, you have a situation where now no one knows where the oranges are coming from. Um, so it's like this very attempt to kind of subdivide the world into um, you know, this amount of oranges from this country at this time of year, ironically produces the very opposite effect. It produces chaos, disorder, um, and um, and I mean, I think you could. 
I think you could read it as um, maybe, you know, I think you could connect it to other ecological issues, like um, to think about how free trade has, um, has created climate problems, climate change problems, um, where it's this, you know, rat, this attempt to kind of make sense of the world, <laughs> um, rationalize the world, that's created a situation in which we may have, you know, um, damaged our climate to the point where it comes back to haunt us. Uh, so I guess that would be that would be how I'd answer that question. Yeah. Um, did you want to ask? Yeah, I do want to ask you a question. I wanted maybe to sort of, if I might put it this way, like straddle kind of modern intelligence welfare, uh, um, which is about how, if you could just tell us more about how you're thinking about your reading practices in terms of how you're deciding which aesthetic elements um, are the ones that um, are, give you the definitive purchase on what the logic of a text is. Because you set up for us that we have these two texts that are kind of working the same way in their commitment to um, a kind of anti-realism, right? This mixing of magical realism, this messing up temporal chronologies, alternate reality. Um, but then um, one of them, at least in the structure of the talk, you're willing to sort of finally um, appraise on the basis of some of its master images, right? Like the, um, the symphony and the, um, the boxing match. Um, and the other one, you want to put the weight on the end. Mm -hmm. um, and ending and resolution has a lot of, um, you know, sort of baggage in literary criticism as the place where or not to evaluate text, right? Um, and then I got the impression from um, uh, your sort of quip about or your way of defining literary realism that ultimately what you want to do is sort of hold these texts to a standard of um, whether or not they are, as you put it, like doing a map, right, the map of um, the antagonism between labor and capital. So um, do you want your, are you, are you thinking about your reading practices as um, how are you discriminating amongst the literary elements that help you figure out what the logic of a text is? Or is it that all neoliberal novels are sort of equally suspect insofar as they're not realist in your definition of what realism is? Mm -hmm. Well, that's a really hard question. Uh, I mean, I. And part of it is there's the tension between, so I, I read these two texts, and to me, like my, my reading of, for instance, Tropic of Orange reflects my very serious attempt to think of every single formal element, because it's a book that is so ambitious formally. Mm -hmm. uh, some people will disagree, but um, so I feel like my reading of it reflects and can, you know, articulate, my reading of it um, uh, reflects my understanding of how the entire thing works, how every different element of it works. However, in the writing of it, certain <coughs> moments are more sort of crystallized key commitments better than others. So in a way, your question kind of points to the tension between um, interpretation and in the writing of it. Um, you know, in Tropic of Orange, this certain image crystallized the logic. In um, Atomic Aztecs, the narrative structure as a whole in the end, and the two different types of narrative temporalities uh, are, uh, crystallize the logic to me more effectively. Um, so that's part of the answer, I guess. Um, I guess there, maybe there's a couple of ways. Um, there's a couple of different forms of critical pressure I'm bringing to bear on these two books. One of them is um, they seem to be, they're speculative, they're imagining utopias in a certain sense, and then I, I consider to what degree they are actually utopic, to what degree they're actually different from the thing they are depicting. Um, but then there, I guess the other critical best pressure that I'm bringing to bear is um, to what degree they function as realism, not in a narrow, narrowly formal sense, but in a more like Lukacian or Lukács plus <laughs> uh, Brechtian sense. Um, 
And um, I don't know, I guess my, my method is to think about the relationship between um, that the best way for a um, speculative fiction to be speculative is to be realist. I mean, it's to articulate contradiction. So I guess that's how it ends. <laughs> Um, yeah. As you might yeah. guess, I have not read either of these things. Um, but when you were talking about the alternate table of contents, I was thinking about Kratasser's hopscotch. Yeah. And I'm just wondering about how, it's a completely ignorant question, I just, how these elements of magic realism and just detection fiction, detective fiction, all the other parts that you're talking about, are being mobilized? Are they like seriously being mobilized? Are they being tyrannized? <coughs> I mean, is doing experimental fiction that's a lot like 40-year-old experimental fiction, that experimental? I just wonder how they're taking up these genres and what the impact or intent is or something. Like, how seriously are they engaging? Mm -hmm. Well, like, the connection to Hopscotch is a great connection, and that gets to the question of, you know, if it was already being done in Hopscotch, then, I mean, this is what Amelia Sorry It doesn't seem like would, a new experiment. This is what Amelia Sorry would say, is that it's, like, Hopscotch was already neoliberal in a sense. Um, but, um... So what's the new... Well, the new is the sort of... Doing. Is the, the new is, you know, it's a... Um, I mean, one argument you could make is that the new is it's an American novelist not in a colonial or post-colonial context or semi-peripheral context, whatever you want to call Latin America, Latin American fiction. Um, so the newest, the newness in a certain way inheres in, it's a different setting um, by, the, by the novelist. Um, the novelist is in a different place. Um, and you could say that change changes things. Like, so, so, I mean, one argument is magic realism and Cortazar, that was always already neoliberal. Another argument is, no, those, those, that style had meaning within a certain context, certain colonial or post-colonial, semi-peripheral context, whatever you want to call it, context, that when it's been... Um, when, it, when it's been incorporated in a context that's totally different, um, when in a way just the form of magic realism is being appropriated and then mixed with a whole bunch of other genres, that that kind of changes the meaning of the genre. Um, um, I feel like there was something else about your question, but... I guess partly I was asking how sincerely that's being taken up or if it's being ironized or like what... I mean, What's the attitude toward? I think it's 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 the answer is yes. To some degree, it's ironized, but the irony is this, the postmodern sort of staging of the inability to tell tell between difference between sincerity and and irony. Like it's a wrestling match. Should we should, so it's a you know why is the fight a wrestling match? Does that mean it's not a real fight? Is it a real fight? Um, at the end, when the wrestling match is over, it's referred to as a performance. Uh, I, I think the point, in a way, is to stage the inability to tell the difference between reality and performance, which sounds like a kind of, yeah, so I think that's, and that's part of the kind of critique of certain boundaries, and, yeah, so it's, yes, <laughs> um, yeah. Davis also has a question, and at least I know he's, he's read the novel. Okay, so, so I haven't read the novel. Um, my question is, though, sort of about uh, the context that you were talking about. And you're sort of, uh, with your read, you're sort of staging the NAFTA as a sort of political, like this massive political shift um, for the Democrats, but I think also more generally, like politically and economically in the United States. Um, and I just want to, this may be also a question about nostalgia in a way, because really, like, Clinton's position isn't that different than Carter's position, right? And we often refer to Nixon as the last liberal president. Right, and you can sort of even trace some of these immigration questions that you're asking about the novel back to Johnson, right, and the sort of massive sort of uh, immigration laws. And so I, I just I wonder, um, the question is sort of like, one, can you just say a little more about why this marks an important shift for you in reading these novels? And two, 
whether or not we should read Yamashita's sort of work in this, in this sort of context of a larger sort of post-war narrative and sort of labor shifts that are. Um, well, to be totally frank, I don't know. Um, my understanding of Clinton's endorsement of NAFTA is that it did represent a departure. Um, if, if, you know, um, it did represent a departure from what the Democrats had been saying, at least in the preceding decade, in the 80s. Um, <coughs> no, not always. I mean, in different parts of history, the Democratic Party has definitely supported free trade. It's just, in the context of the immediate, um, uh, immediately preceding decade, um, Clinton's support of NAFTA did represent a departure. And it did, I mean, frankly, it did put him, it was, it put him at serious conflict with the Congressional Democrats. They, NAFTA was only passed because he got Republican support. Um, so, um, I guess we could debate about the sort of timeline of neoliberalism that I gestured towards. Um, but that's how I would answer that. Um, she, I mean... She's clearly, I mean, NAFTA is a character in her novel. She's clearly responding to NAFTA. Um, she's, she, her book came out three years after NAFTA went into effect, when the sort of effects on immigration had already started to become clear. Um, so I, I feel like that, that makes it worthwhile to sort of consider, that, that in of itself makes it worthwhile to think about the relationship between her text and the discourse of NAFTA itself. So, cool. There's one quick question that you, you're going to have to have some kind of answer for, and you don't have to answer it right now, but is, do you have an observation about the relationship between Asian American literature and these dystopic narratives produced under, you know, neoliberalism or the transnational novel or however you want to put it? Otherwise, it looks like you're just saying by coincidence, happens to be that you're looking at two Asian American texts that are doing that are doing this. Yeah, I should have a good answer to that question. <laughs> um, I mean, let me think. I'm just gonna I'm thinking out loud as I'm uh -huh. speaking, but um, Christie's answer was just that she claimed them as both Latino literature. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I mean, and they are sort of, they're both, and they've been compared, I mean, yellow chicanismo, I've heard them refer to as, you know, they're um, Asian American writers writing about um, Latin American, well, Asian Asian and Latin American. Right, it's issues. about a tra transnational economy, both yeah. are skeptical of cultural nationalism and multiculturalism. Yeah. You know, so there's certain moves that they both make. Yeah. Um, I... To be honest, as I'm thinking about it, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering to myself if, yeah, if, if it even matters within my argument that they're both Asian American. What, what about internment? Well, so yeah, Manzanar Murakami, mm -hmm. that character is named after, um, okay. named after the camp where Japanese Americans were interned during World War II. So um, that's the older state model, right? Mm -hmm. Like you talked about the Pacific Rim Auditorium. And there's a re-spatialization of economic co-prosperity, mm -hmm. right, that's configured through the Pacific Rim. And it seems like this is part of that shift that you're trying to mark. And it seems as though Manzanar is the residual trace of a different formulation when Japan and the U.S. as competing empires, right? It marks something quite different in a different type of, you know, violence. So. Yeah, I'm, I, um... I'm not sure how I how to. I'm not sure what to do with these issues. That's that's my last answer. Well, so one thing you sort of have to say that right, was that Asian American literature was itself the very category of Asian American literature is itself produced by you know, that set of issues wherever it's through. In other words, Asian American literature is as much a neoliberal phenomenon as after that. Um, Ryan kind of 
contemplate this. Yeah. <laughs>